Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. The human experience is in geosynchronous orbit above the Amazon rainforest as we speak to our guest, Mr. Hamilton Souther. Hamilton, it's a pleasure. Welcome to HXP. Thank you very much for having me. It's a really, you know, great day to be here. So you're a master shaman. I mean, how does how does that happen? Well, basically, you go through apprenticeship, and uh, if you survive apprenticeship, you end up getting the title of master shaman. But really, it comes down to finding other master shamans from lineages where, you know, the the heritage and the knowledge base has been passed down from generation to generation. And then if you're not within those lineages, you know, you're lucky if you get accepted from the outside. Was there was there something that brought you into being interested in shamanism? Was there a specific thing or key moment that helped you do that? Uh, yeah, definitely. When I graduated from the University of Colorado in 2000, the year after that, I started to have spontaneous experiences where I started to have visions. And in those visions, um, it was really clear to me that it was a direct and sort of typical calling to shamanism. And so, um, you know, I had read, I had studied anthropology, and so I had read a lot about it, and I had read you know, about a number of different cultures that practice shamanism. And there's a traditional call, and I started to experience it. And while that was very foreign to me and, you know, something that produced a lot of doubt and fear, it was also exciting. And so um, it was something that I thought deserved at least an exploration. Hmm. Yeah. Um, what was what was your journey like when as you explored Iquitos and and that area? I mean, what, was there was there a reason that you chose that specific area for the Blue Morpho Center? Uh, you know, during my apprenticeship, it was really a question of first finding it. I had to go on the journey to find the apprenticeship, and the journey wound me through Peru ultimately to Iquitos, and then from Iquitos really deep into the forest and. That really dictated the location. Once I found Alberto and Julio, Alberto Torres Davila and Julio Jerena Pinedo, the two master shamans that trained me, we formed a you know a lifelong, basically like familial relationship where they were like you know father and grandfather to me in shamanism, and they were from that general vicinity in the forest. You know, so um, that kind of dictated why we were in Iquitos and stayed in Iquitos. Mm -hmm. how did how did that relationship between your teachers emerge Uh, was I mean was there something that kind of instantly drew you to them well in the case of Alberto I went to Alberto for healing I had gotten really sick in my first year in the Amazon and um, I needed healing and so I had heard of this great healer that was about a day's journey away from Iquitos and so I I gave it a, a whirl to see if he could help me and um Julio lived further out into the forest, which is where I ended up building our very first base camp. And, you know, the relationship with Julio developed over time. But ultimately, Julio got sick and I performed a a healing on him. And he felt that it had saved his life. It was, you know, a a very kind of archaic story type to live through very Joseph Campbell, very hero journey with the great elder in need and me being able to provide that need just in that moment. And, um, you know, in exchange for that, he asked what I wanted. And I just told him that I wanted to learn from him and to to train. And so that's what he agreed to. So I'm very, I'm very curious about what your first experience with ayahuasca was like. I mean, how did, how did that take place? And was it the way that you imagined it would be? When I went and participated in my first ayahuasca ceremony, there was very little in the the written world and you know online world about it. Um, I had very little understanding of what I was getting myself into, 
And I think that was positive and negative. I think it was two-sided. Um, I had read a couple of accounts from other shamans that had participated, and I had thought to myself that it was impossible that it could really be you know, that intense. I thought like, oh, no, it can't be that intense. It can't move that fast. It can't be that colorful. It can't be that deep. There's no way that the cleansing could go you know, to such extremes in just one night. How, how would that be possible over four or five hours? And I really thought you know, in my own ignorance that um, they, had, they must have overwritten or sensationalized the experience. And when I got out there and I was sitting with the shaman and it was just the two of us deep in the forest and we were, you know, a good 24 or more hour travel away from any place where we could get support or assistance. And we were just deep in the forest in an uninhabited part of the forest with a bottle of ayahuasca. You know, Really, the experience was was much more intense, moved much faster, was much more colorful than anything I could have imagined, and also much more healing. And then at, at the end of that first ceremony, I, you know, I received the visions that that was where I was going to apprentice and that I would be, you know, study ayahuasca shamanism, which seemed absurd to me considering how intense that first experience was and how difficult it was for me. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, when, when these shamans perform this ayahuasca ceremony, I, I know that Icaros, the, the song is very important to the part of the healing process of it. Uh, do you remember the first time that you kind of heard one? Yeah. Icaros are, are the sacred chants that are used inside the ceremony and they really are a system of communication between the energetic world slash spirit world or, you know, and the shamans. And so the very first time I heard an Icaro was in that first ayahuasca ceremony. And when I started to see the really, you know, traditional Shipibo designs in great neon colors overlaying the entirety of earth-based reality and empirical reality around me, and they all started to move to the shaman's Icaros, I knew that, you know, that this was going to be a very different experience to something that uh, that I had ever had before. And then from there, you know, I became fascinated by them because you have many different kinds of experiences in ceremony, but often you can experience senses in multiple forms in multiple ways. And so when you can see sound, it's incredible. To be in a state of consciousness, to actually be able to see with your eyes open the movement and the, the effect that sound has on the energetics of a space, it's fascinating. And when you see the, the Icaros take color, take shape, take form, and they, these visions, you know, for those who are not familiar with this, are very common to the ayahuasca experience. This isn't, you know, some like, for them, really, really extreme kind of sensory experience. It's very, very common to be able to, to smell and hear and see things that you would normally not be aware of. And that heightened sense of, of senses and that heightened psychic ability is, is something that's you know really, really amazing. And the, the Icaros are, are a beautiful mix, really, you know, for the, the ceremony. They, for the shamans that sing many of them, they'll be constantly singing hour after hour during the ceremony. And they form a melodic and a lyrical guide to the ceremony. Yeah. Do you think maybe we can get you to sing one before we close tonight? Sure, sure, whatever you want. Okay, that would be great. Uh, okay, so just moving on here. I mean, is there is there something that you feel like ayahuasca is meant to teach you? Ultimately, more about life, more about you, more about your mind, more about your psyche, more about your body, more about uh, what it means to be a human being. I think that the modern world has encapsulated and encased a homogenous notion of reality that, while very stable for most people, you know, limits the the exploration of what a human life really is. And when you open up to something like an ayahuasca experience, you're really welcoming the unknown into your life. You're welcoming mysticism and shamanism and spirit and energy into your life. And it has a, a tremendous potential to open somebody, to awaken somebody, to help somebody transcend different kinds of difficulties, blocks, and barriers that they've experienced. And 
So I think really that entire knowledge base is what ayahuasca is there to be able to share with people. And it's something that that for many, many people, many thousands of people, tens of thousands of people have experienced tremendous benefit from the ceremonies. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is interesting how, how much of a increase there is of people looking for this medicine and traveling to places like Peru and Iquitos to, to find it. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, for the, for the last four, I would say the last six, seven years, there's been a constant increase. You know, yeah. consistently increasing as word goes out and the number of people's positive experiences are being shared. You know, when, when you have a miraculous experience, there's a, a part of you that wants to share it with your confidants and your, your greatest supporters. And, you know, that piques interest and curiosity and the consistency of positive experiences is vast and amazing from the work that's being done in Brazil and in Peru and in Ecuador. And, in the case of ayahuasca, you also want to always, you know, say that it's not for everybody. You know, it's it's a very extreme experience. There are many medications that are contraindicated to it that require you to come off of those medications in a safe way. And at our center, you know, for many of our guests, we require that they receive a doctor's permission that they're in fit health for the ceremonies. Hmm. Yeah, I can see how that would be important. I mean, so as as a shaman, and if we could move into the more shamanic aspects of what you do, I mean, what is it that you do? Are you moving through these other dimensions? Are you encountering beings? How does that work? Well, a shaman is the sacred keeper of knowledge and wisdom for his or her community, as well as being really a doctor, like a field doctor. Uh, and so the shamans are plant medicine specialists. They know hundreds and hundreds of medicinal plants in the forest. They can walk into the forest and point to almost any plant of which there are thousands of species and know them. They know the forest like the back of their hand. And so it really starts there. And in the Amazon, the shamans develop a very close relationship to the plants. Now, for a Westerner, that may sound, you know, different or weird or something like that, but via the ayahuasca and the experiences, the shamans have uh, an ability to merge consciousness with the plants and be able to start to communicate with them. And so they start to reach the plant on a truly energetic level, and they believe that the plants have specific energies unto themselves that represent their spirits and that the spirit of the plant, very much like the human spirit, can communicate and be shared. And so the pantheon of, of medicine there doesn't differentiate between energies and spirits and the physical body and, and the mind. It's all treated at once. So if somebody has a physical ailment, their entire being is treated. If somebody has a spiritual ailment, their entire being is treated. If somebody has a mental ailment, their entire being is treated. And so th they really believe in a holistic approach. And then from there, you know, get into a very mystical and very magical outlook on life itself. They inherently believe that life is based in spirit, that spirit is part and parcel of every experience, that every living thing has a spirit, including humans. And that through the spirit, when you become very attuned to your own spirit, you gain the capacity to communicate with other spirits. And so the shamans identify with themselves as spirit and then begin a long process to learn how to consistently and accurately, without delusion or confusion, engage in these communications. So the shaman is, is going into a state of consciousness in which communication on the energetic plane is possible and in the physical context of that plane there's a possibility of you know what is called going out of body into spiritual realms and dimensions into visionary scenarios that are three-dimensional into landscapes and uh, visionary context that seems very enchanted very beautiful most of those realms or dimensions are filled with beings, entities, or spirits, or really what you would think of as like a 3D visionary shape that can maintain a two-way communication. So you can you know, begin to communicate with those beings. The beings form guides, and you can develop a, a very strong relationship, very trusting relationship with them. 
And in the and especially in the case of Amazonian healing, it's the doctor spirits or the med- the medicine based spirits that are seen as the ones that perform the healing. And so the shamans are establishing a relationship between the participants and those beings that come from the plants or from animals or from, you know, these other dimensional realms. And again, the experiences are very, very consistent, very, very consistent between people. So many people have common visions, many people have common experience, many people have common uh, visionary experience all at the same time. You know, after after my first ayahuasca experience, I never had another alcohol al- alcoholic drink again. That was eight months ago. So, I mean, I'm wondering if if you notice that there are some sort of like entities or something that are con- something that's connected in. Are you detaching those things? Well, you know, if you if you look at life from an understanding of spirit and understanding of energy then it would make sense that you as a human being would have an energetic reality and more or less everything that you consume that has a consciousness altering or mind altering capacity has a way of opening you energetically and or engaging with you. And so depending on the nature of the relationship people have to different substances, it's very common for them to go through the the ceremonies and then decide that those substances weren't really serving them and that they have moved on to a plane in their own life where where whatever was enticing about the the other substances no longer is. And so lots of people give up alcohol after ceremony, even just after one or two ceremonies, which is also why ayahuasca is used in the Amazon and in the traditional world as a way of treating drug addiction. You know, so or really any kind of addiction, not not only drug addiction, but any kind of addiction. And so you know, ayahuasca over the years has become much more renowned for that, for the ability to to heal people from, you know, tobacco to alcohol to you know hard hard drugs, and uh, as well as behavioral addictions. Hmm. So you went you went on to found found your shamanism center, the Blue Morpho Center. Yeah, from Blue the seeds, Morpho Center. From the seeds of your experiences, uh, was there was there an aha moment when you? When you decided to do that, or how did that Yeah, happen? Blue Morpho was a, an initial creation of mine based off of where I was living in the forest. People were interested in coming out to where I was living. It was so remote. I lived in a tiny community along a tributary to the Amazon. The upper river for me, there were no inhabitants. So, you know, there was unexplored forest awaiting people, and tourists were very interested in going out into that area of the forest. And so I founded Blue Morpho based out of my own apprenticeship and the, and the desire to, to have a way to be able to take them out into the forest and have, you know, really a, an incredibly mind expanding and, and, you know, huge adventure. And so through that work, it turned out that the more we got into the ayahuasca ceremonies and the shamanic work, the less interested our, our guests were in the jungle adventure side of things. And so uh, we started that, you know, as a way to be able to continue our work with ayahuasca with others and ultimately provide healing. At first, we just held ceremonies for the sake of the ceremonies themselves because people were interested, curious, whatever. But then we became quickly known for being able to help people through very specific illnesses like uh, depression, anxiety disorders. PTSD, addictions, and then people, you know, who are really, really sick and looking for a solution started to come to us. And then organically, little by little by little, Blue Morpho grew just to accommodate the number of people that wanted to come. Yeah, it does seem like Blue Morpho kind of took a very organic growth. What kind of effect do you think it had on the local economy there? Well, the local economy and the areas that we worked were very positively affected. We've always had as positive and balanced business practices as possible. And we do a lot of charity work for the area around us. And so, you know, we've provided over the years many, many jobs that weren't available in those areas. And somebody could say, well, why would you need to provide jobs in the Amazon? And the reality is that the Amazon is part of, the Peruvian Amazon is part of the the Peruvian social structure. And so it's all money-based economies. 
and the locals need to be able to to raise money to be able to survive and so you know it's very hard in the amazon to survive on your own when you're just a subsistence agriculturalist and hunter and or fisherman and so you know we've we've provided countless jobs over the years as well as a number of charity programs including providing the entire school uniforms for a whole town as well as all of their books and school supplies so you know for years now we've helped an entire town put all of their kids through elementary education taking the economic burden off of them for having to provide the uniforms and school supplies which really adds up for a, you know a family of two or three children to being two or three months worth of salary in a year and so it's a significant amount of money to them and it's something that we've always supported and education is always something that I've supported you know from the western education that I had to the shamanic and indigenous education that I got in the forest and so you know we give back in many different ways and you know consistently try to aid the the fledgling and and you know slowly slowly evolving economy in the amazon yeah that's that's amazing that you've been able to do that and have such a positive impact there uh, what kind? What kinds of things do you think? Sorry, what kind of things does Blue Morpho offer to its guests? Well, Blue Morpho is a destination-based center, and so when people come for a for a group, they are uh, you know coming to participate in ceremonies and either explore ayahuasca or receive the different kinds of healing practices. When we go to our center. There are a lot of other activities that are offered to keep the days interesting for everybody. Normally, our groups are six days, and so every day there's two different activities that are really more related to the jungle as well as guided visualizations, yoga practices, and then the ceremonies themselves. And so we have a, a very well-rounded itinerary to make sure that you know everybody is having a, really a, an incredible time from seeing pink river dolphins to... You know, going out and going on a medicinal plant hike or seeing the Victoria Regia giant lily pads or identifying different species of monkeys and then going into the ceremonies at night and doing, you know, the really intense spiritual work. What's the size of an average ceremony there? Uh, Blue Morpho ceremonies now range typically somewhere in the, the you know, 35 to 45 people. Is that large? Depends on your perspective. Uh, I think it's probably medium sized. If you look at the the you know ayahuasca based churches in Brazil where they work with hundreds, if not thousands, it would be seen as small. But there's also you know smaller ceremonies that are going on in different places where there's five, ten, fifteen, twenty people in them. Hmm. Yeah. And how many how many healers or shamans do you have in house there? Well, for, it depends on the group, but typically we have two or three master shamans as well as three or four apprentice shamans and another four to six, if not eight, trained helpers for each ceremony. If we could go back to um, your story with Alberto and Julio, uh, sure. could, you, could you tell us more about what it was like working with them? Working with them was amazing. Alberto and Julio were, you know, a kind of human being that I had never really met before and strong, clear, impressive, uh, you know, just really amazing, awe-inspiring for me. They were so clear. They were so decided. They knew exactly what they were doing and why they were doing it. They had compassion and love in their hearts and they had this tremendous wisdom that they could share in a variety of different means. When I started to apprentice with them, it was shocking to me that education came through visionary experiences you know i was used to a chalkboard or a whiteboard and you know computers and things like that and libraries to learn <laughs> and all of a sudden i'm i'm with them in the forest you know in a canoe just talking about life or identifying different kinds of medicinal plants or in ceremony and in in ceremony you know all the teaching was done non-verbally it was completely telepathic which right there is is amazing in its own right to go through years and years of training via telepathy is Wait, something that's really let unheard. me let me stop you there so the teachings that were handed down to you were done via telepathy correct yeah they're all done within vision and ayahuasca ceremonies there's very wow. little verbal interaction or talking during the day about it you're expected to already know that 
almost everything that you're taught in shamanism, if you go to classes in the, in the States, if you go to like shamanic classes or journey work or anything like that, the basics that are taught, you're expected to already know. And if you don't already know those things, then you're not considered of the creed to be able to be an apprentice. And so it's like being tossed directly into graduate school. There's no elementary, junior high, high school, university. No, it's like it's right in. And on the, you know, the first, the very first day that, that you start to be trained, the shamans, in this case Alberto and Julio, you know, took me into a visionary realm that would hold a consistent mind meld where I knew that they were inside my thoughts and could hear all of my thoughts as well as share specific thoughts to me and open up different kinds of visionary experiences that would, through surviving them, be educational. And when I asked Julio if a, a white man could learn, he said, if you can survive, we all bleed red. Literally putting my, you know, my life in danger, saying, you know, you could die in this apprenticeship. And so it was very, very intense, but they consider all of those tests tests of virtue, and you get taught entirely through visionary experiences because that's the realm in which you work. You have to be able to navigate with precision the visionary realms and know exactly where you are and how to guide multiple people simultaneously. And so to have that level of clarity, they make apprenticeship very, very difficult. Wow. That's truly profound. Um, it, was there... Is there something that was specifically difficult in your learning that you can remember or think of? Everything was specifically <laughs> When I moved into the Amazon, I had to learn how to paddle a canoe. I had to learn how to make an oar and a fishing pole. I had to learn how to use a machete and an axe. I had to learn how to walk through the forest. You don't walk in the same way as you do in a, in a, even in the wilderness in the States. The jungle's so dense. I had to learn how to just to survive out there, how to eat, how to provide my own food, had to, you know, learn how to, to withstand the vigors of apprenticeship, which are very, very intense. You know, for well over 10 years, it was expected that I would drink ayahuasca over 100 times a year. And so, you know, for the people who've had experience, you know how profound one, two, or three ceremonies is, you know, imagine being in that situation every few days consistently for over a decade. You go through what are called dietas. Dietas are a period of time of great fasting where you drink different kinds of medicinal plants, most of them that are not psychoactive, but you're already in such a transformed state of consciousness, an expanded state of consciousness, that you're communicating directly with the plants literally just from drinking teas made from their barks or roots or leaves. And all of that's difficult. There's extreme periods of different kinds of abstinences where, you know, you live a, a, a life of deep cleansing and purification for extended periods of time, isolated from society and community. And so you spend large amounts of time in the forest alone or just with the master shamans. And it's, it's all intense and it's all difficult and it's all amazing if you can survive it. For the people that I've taught over the years when they start, I say to them, this is the worst idea you ever had. <laughs> apprenticeship is the worst idea you ever had unless you complete apprenticeship. And then it turns into the best idea you ever had. But you know, there's a very clear path when you go to the university that's four years or high school that's four years or graduate school that could be you know more years than that. But it's a clear path. In this case, Apprenticeship has no clarity in the path. It's strictly survival and learning to the point that you reach this prophesized endpoint called the title of Master Shaman. And then once you get that title, you find out, which is the great shamanic irony, that the only thing that changes is that now you have more responsibility. So you're, you're, you know, you're working so hard to this endpoint that you don't even know when it's going to come. It could be anywhere you know, from years to a decade to achieve, which just not even knowing, you know, when, when a certain endpoint of a tremendous journey is, makes it much more difficult. Even if you compared it to like climbing a, a great peak or a mountain like Everest, you know the idea is to get to the top. In this case, you know, you don't have any idea what this endpoint even looks like. And it's just a title. It's just called Master Shaman or Maestro. 
And so you, you see other people who have it and you see that they're certainly not like you and they're more skilled at you in those arts. And you have to, you know, learn and, and continue persevering and forging ahead with tremendous grit, tremendous strength and dedication into this great unknown. And that constant pursuit, you know, makes you a much stronger individual, but it, it's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, healing is the foundation for all of this. I mean, this is why people are traveling to the rainforest to find this. I mean, Western medicine isn't working. I mean, what's your opinion on that? Well, simply that uh, Western medicine has limitations. My father was a Western medical practitioner. He was a doctor and a surgeon. And uh, my mother was a nurse. We We came from this very scientific, very western medical background family and during my youth my father was very open with me about the tremendous miracles that western medicine could produce as well as the tremendous limitations that it had in terms of its knowledge base and understandings as well as the difficulties that there were in terms of diagnosing and really being able to provide you know healing treatments and I think there's a tr there needs to be a tremendous gratitude to Western medicine because I think the majority of us would have already been a casualty and had a much shorter lifespan without it. I've you know needed antibiotics many many times to end infection or to to release parasites or from different injuries that I've had where surgery is the only reason that I can still walk and so I have a, a tremendous gratitude for it but I I do not think that it is the beginning and the end all. It's only a uh, breadth of knowledge and capacity that's constantly being expanded. And in the case of mental health and mental health disorders, which most people typically come to Io for ayahuasca healing, you know, the abilities that we have within psychology and psychiatry are extremely limited. And so it's it's very, very difficult when somebody receives a diagnosis that he or she's depressed or has an anxiety disorder or PTSD and will now have to carry that for the rest of his or her life. It's a tremendous burden and weight. And then in the idea of Western psychiatry to be able to f provide psychiatric treatment with medications that then somebody is expected to be on for the rest of their life has tremendous side effects and difficulties. And so, you know, through our work, many people come to us because they want to they want to go beyond that. They don't want to be labeled for the rest of their life somebody who is depressed or somebody who has this disorder or somebody with PTSD, you know. And so I think in many ways innocently people get into different experiences in their life and end up in some extreme trauma, you know, or or completely unrelated to them like children who are abused like they they had nothing to do with that they were brought into this world into a family that ended up being abusive or others that ended up being abusive to them and now they have this problem you know and, and there's very little that can be done to create as of net right now to 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 give as a cure for that and so people come to ayahuasca for that for that purpose because western psychiatry and psychology has not yet been able to establish cures for these illnesses now that being said, not everybody's cured who drinks ayahuasca, you know, but but a lot of them are. Many, many people have total remission or gain the capacities and life skills to be able to transcend the burden of the problem that they have. What was what was the most remarkable or profound thing that you've seen that someone has healed from? The most remarkable really borderlands on the miraculous. I've seen cancer disappear, like from one day to the next. There it is, and then the next day it's gone. I've seen a person healed of blindness who was blind because of Lyme's disease, legally blind. They were in the, an adult when they became blind from Lyme's disease, have uh, you know total remission to the point that they were no longer blind. Uh, I've seen people who've suffered from gastrointestinal illnesses, problems with their colon and, and intestines for 30, 40, 50 years have healing in three or four days, just disappearance of the illness that never comes back. You know, depression, imagine if you were, if you had psychiatric problems from the age of two or three and now you're in your 30s or 40s. 
you know, like like Kira Salik, who wrote the article for National Geographic, you know, that was published about her miraculous healing of depression and other uh, mental health issues that she had. She, you know, she was healed, and and it's fascinating and miraculous and amazing. And it's something that I'm truly grateful for that in my life I got to witness and participate in transformations for people like that. It was very rewarding and, you know, something that was very heart expanding. Have you ever had someone have a negative reaction after a ceremony? Depends on what you call a negative reaction. Uh, there are people that certainly have had great difficulties emotionally handling their experience. You have to be very careful with the plants, how much... Uh, somebody is given and for how what duration because it can kick off psychosis you do not want to give somebody who is is not psychologically stable these different kinds of psychoactive plants it's it's not healthy for them you know like I said earlier there are many 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 kind many people who are not suitable candidates to participate in these ceremonies and so um, there are people that have adverse reactions. I have seen it where it's it's overwhelmingly emotional, where people have been terrified to the point that uh, you know they're they're shaky the next day, literally, <laughs> like they they can be trembling at the the fear that they confronted, you know. But if you if you go deep into their story, you're going to find that there's a reason for that. There's always a reason for all of the different kinds of reactions people have to ceremonies. Hmm, you know, yeah. people people are, are, they're not the great collective that we think of. They really are individuals. You know, it's, it's an individual human body. It's not just human body. Human bodies are not clones. They're not the same. They don't have the same genetics. They don't have the same uh, makeup, structure, size, history, experience, right? It, they're very, very different. And so the, you have to be a, a candidate, a proper candidate to participate in these ceremonies. I mean, how do you think these plants do this? Like, where does this come from? I think it was Terrence McKenna who said that these plants were older than humanity and were connected into the consciousness of the planet. So what's your take on it? My take is that there are many, many theories. And I don't think that particularly any of the theories are right. Uh, as, as is a theory, they're meant to be questioned and explored. The highest level of understanding that I've received is that plants, certain plants have an ability when ingested to merge with what we know of as human consciousness and utilize that capacity to be able to experience right alongside an individual human being. And that the plants obviously are older than humanity. They've been around much longer than Homo sapiens sapiens. And the chemicals that they have are designed to be able to create an altered state in which a communication can take place. And if you thought of a plant, that would be a very uh, interesting way to be able to co-create and to communicate with another kind of being on this planet. If you were a rooted species in the ground and you're just sitting there, well, if you you know evolved capacities that you could communicate with an animal because the animal gnawed on you or ate you or consumed you, it would be a, a tremendous way to be able to access that animal's uh, life. And I think the plants do that with human beings just as much as they do with any other animals that consume them. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, you founded an education foundation called uh, Modern Shamanism. Yeah, absolutely. What, what, is, what is that and you know, what is it offered to a newcomer? What's the difference? Well, modern shamanism is a discipline of shamanism that I created. You have to think of shamanism in different kinds of disciplines. Like there's si different kinds of Siberian disciplines, there's Amazonian disciplines, African disciplines, Northern Canadian disciplines, South American disciplines. Australian disciplines. And when I looked at modern society, what I saw was that modern society didn't have its own kind of shamanism. And so I was getting really into the, the depths of my shamanic exploration after having practiced just straight for eight or nine years. And I realized that I wanted to create a kind of shamanism for modern society. And so I went on a, a quite a journey of my own exploration of how to be able to do that. And I kind of stripped shamanism from its cultural implications 
and found a kind of consistent core architecture of beliefs and ideologies and understandings throughout all the different kinds of shamanism practiced worldwide. And I used that as a framework to be able to start to establish a practice. Modern shamanism is taught online, but you really learn it in your day. It's it's activities that you do from the, the online reading and, and audios that you can listen to that explain each of the activities. But really, then you start to do activities every single day that you're practicing inside modern society. And so when you do that, it gives you... A, what would be thought of as like sort of a shamanic frame of mind, which is much more connected. It's a more holistic approach to understanding reality. Your mind and your brain and your heart and your body and your spirit and your soul all work together. You teach them all how to work together and how to be in extended states of consciousness through total sobriety throughout the entirety of your day. It's designed to make you more creative, benefit your life, help you with time management, efficiency, uh, better work capacities, uh, better relationship and more grounded relationship to the spirit world all the time. And so it's a tremendous practice for the, you know, now hundreds of people who practiced it with us. It, people, you know, learning how to perform miracles. We had a, a girl whose relative went missing and she did remote location and located the, the relative two states from where the, the person went missing. We had another gentleman whose daughter was in an accident and was going to uh, need surgery to remove an organ from her body. She was very, very young. She was younger than five. And uh, the father did a modern shamanism ceremony. And the next day, she was healthy and no longer needed the surgery. And she was released from the hospital. She was in ICU. There have been miracles that have that have happened that are tremendous, but most of the work isn't as miraculous as that. Most of it is a, a daily educational system to transform your daily life into one based in the rudiments of shamanism and spirit, opening you to having expanded capacities. Now, you know, considering people who are interested in learning, going to apprenticeship. I get asked all the time about people who want to apprentice. I highly recommend modern shamanism as a course to take before you go and do that. I highly recommend it as a way of getting fully immersed into the shamanic world where you're in, in an environment that you relate to and understand well before you go and relate to a traditional environment that is uh, you know, completely foreign or unknown to you. And for people who are really interested in shamanic practices and learning as well, it transforms you into a shaman. By the end of it, you are a modern shaman and capable of practicing shamanism for yourself and others. Yeah, yeah. So you published uh, Journey of One in 2011, which is a book that documents some of the insights that you received through your shamanic ceremonies, was there was there something that you learned or anything fresh that you learned through writing that? Journey of One was my attempt at creating a shamanic journey through the medium of a book. And so when you read a book, it's very linear in its nature, and most shamanism is relatively nonlinear. And so uh, I wanted to create a capacity for somebody to have his or her own journey of, of awakening, exploration, and understanding without me detailing what that journey should or shouldn't look like. And so if, you, if I just wrote a book with insights, I would explain the insights, and then you would take from that my explanation. But what I wanted to do is provide the insights and then allow somebody to ponder them, uh, dismiss them, question them, go back to them, and not have to read a book from cover to cover, literally be able to open it at any point and start the journey from there, flip through wherever you're called to stop to read that insight. And I organized the insights, and I, you know the book has hundreds, but I organized the insights from the most abstract to the most concrete, so that as you went through them, you know you could explore, for instance, love or companionship, relationship, uh, healing you know, all these different themes that are found within the book, and you would be able to have your own journey. The writing of it was important for me, too, as well, in terms of my own experience, because as I said, you have so many different realizations and understandings through your apprenticeship and, you know, through your shamanic ceremonies, 
but rarely does somebody have an opportunity to coalesce all of that into just one form. And so after, you know, eight, nine years of practice or yeah, about that long, it gave me an opportunity to, uh, to really bring all of that together. You know, it gave me an opportunity to, to coalesce the knowledge base and to be able to say, okay, up until now, these are many, not all, but many of the realizations that I've had. Yeah. You know, we're, we're approaching the end here. Uh, you've, you've had a couple movements that, you know, in your own words, uh, raise consciousness through love and end global conflict. What, I mean, what is your position on the state of the world and where do you think we're headed? Well, first of all, you know, my, my latest creation is the Blue Morpho Foundation. And the Blue Morpho Foundation is a charity. It's a 501c3 IRS tax exempt charity. And its goal is to uh, research and find cures for mental illness. And when I look at the state of the world, I think mental health is one of the greatest crises that the modern world is facing. And, uh, you know, the stats are just incredible. Over a billion people with mental health difficulty or disorders. Every single person I know's life has been touched themselves having difficulty or when or somebody that they know or a relative. And so what we're we're doing about it is to look at the world and say, okay, what can we do? We need to do something to shift consciousness. And when I went through, you know, shamanism and even beyond shamanism into to greater expressions of my own spirituality, I realized that <laughs> consciousness was the next realm to be fully understood and discovered by science. It's always been known about, it's been relegated to mysticism and different kinds of spiritual explorations, mind, body, spirit, the new age, really whatever. But it was time to merge a deep understanding with, of consciousness to science. And so I went on my own personal mission to codify and to map what makes human consciousness unique. And I was able to do that. And so now we're teaming with allopathic medicine, PhDs and uh, psychotherapy and MDs and psychiatry to come together and really look for cures for these trauma-based illnesses so that we could provide not only healing but expansion of consciousness on a much larger level and to have it be fully integrated with Western medical approaches. Is, is Blue Morpho something that you'd like to see kind of centers all over the world? I mean, is that what you're looking for? No, not centers all over the world. What I would like to see is that Blue Morpho ultimately has a tremendous impact on uh, global concerns and global problems. And so right now we're starting focusing on mental health, but I think it extends much beyond that. Once the mind is is freed from the difficulties that it's having, it starts to make very different decisions than the decisions it would make under the the weight of that mental difficulty. And, you know, if we extend that idea of, of difficulty just to the stress that we experience in the modern world, what I would like to see is that ultimately we made a tremendously positive impact on uh, a much greater scope than we would be able to do from the Amazon or just uh, through one modality. I would like to see that we extend through many, many different uh, treatment capacities and, and methods and then to be able to share it in a uh, way that can be respected by science as well as mysticism and, you know, help people. Ultimately, that's how it all started. It started in my own pursuit to help myself and to learn these incredible arts and then also now to extend that to helping, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of others and then hopefully more and more and more until we've impacted, you know, hundreds of millions worldwide. But the, the main goal is to to really help people just live better lives, to empower them to experience a much better existence while we're here on Earth, you know, touring outer space, going around the sun. I love it, man. I I know we're on a phone call. Sound quality is, is you know, leaves a bit to be desired, but I'm going to hold you to hearing that, Icaros. If you could just kind of let us hear it, man, and I, would, I would love it. Sure, sure.
Cielo, cielo, ayahuasca, ando y manda un troncocito, punta y manda un congonjito, flores y dangue oloroso, cuerposito con ayari, rebelde así, toy nini. Cuerposito kunayari, So that's a Cielo Ayahuasca Icaro that's typically used at the beginnings of uh, traditional ceremonies in the Amazon. It's used to open up the visionary space. Wow. Wow, blown away. Got chills, man. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much. Where can people find more about you, your work, Blue Morpho, the website? Yeah, the best thing is to just look for us online. You can look for us at uh, bluemorphofoundation.org for the, the charity work that we're doing in the States. And we're just getting ready to launch our PTSD initiative to provide the first ever worldwide cure for PTSD. And we need all the support that we can get. So any people who can help fundraise and volunteers, please we're looking for donors and special benefactors who can help us, you know, make this a global reality. It's something that uh, is, I think many people can agree uh, the world needs. And then for down in the Amazon, Blue Morpho Tours. So bluemorphotours.com. And you can always find me on Facebook uh, under my name, Hamilton Souther. Well, Hamilton, I really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for the, the time as well. And uh, great luck with the podcast. Fantastic. I appreciate it.